internationalize domain names and email addresses internationalization brings the internet to a huge step closer to fulfilling its promise of facilitating uh, the sharing of knowledge globally and promising connectivity to the next billion new internet users. Uh, so for those in underserved regions, such capabilities would remove yet another barrier in information access by enabling communication in native languages. So to give you a short introduction, who's joining this panel, um, I would ask everybody to give a short statement, who you are and uh, why you think that you are capable to talk about universal acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that sounds good. My name is Christian Dawson and I am executive director of the Internet Infrastructure Coalition. Uh, in that role, I, I serve uh, as co-chair of a group on um, best practices and they tasked me to uh, go to ICANN to help uh, start to lead conversations about what we were going to do around the topic of universal acceptance of um, domain names. There I met with a number of different uh, people and we started getting the idea that we should put together a permanent group that works on this issue. Uh, I ended up writing the um, charter for the Universal Acceptance Steering Group, which is a group that is now formed, if you take a look at this video that we're going to see in a little bit, uh, it says uasg.tech, that's the website for the Universal Acceptance Steering Group, uh, and that's the logo that we came up with for Universal, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, Ram Mohan is our chair, and I'm vice chair of that group now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Peter Janssen. I'm the technical manager of URID, URID being the .eu registry. So uh, why am I uh, uh, capable or, or uh, confident that I have something useful to say here? Well, in a sense, we are a utility company. Uh, we provide the basic infrastructure of, uh, of the internet. I think without DNS, the average person on the internet would not be able to use the internet anymore because if the domain name system would not exist, then, well, you wouldn't get any resolving to uh, host names or IP addresses or whatsoever. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, if we're talking about the average user, we're talking about uh, any user in the world, including people that would not use the Latin script. And even within Europe, which is our uh, territory that we cover with the uh, .eu domain names, we have two scripts being Greek and Cyrillic that uh, people are using as their first and foremost uh, script to interact with the world at large. So in that sense, we do support IDN and, and we have some, something to say there, I guess. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, Bert Hubert. I'm the founder of uh, PowerDNS and I also still uh, program on it. Uh, PowerDNS powers around half of all domain names in Europe, around 30% uh, around the world. And around 20% of Europe uh, uses PowerDNS as their domain name uh, resolver. Um, so all the IDN and universal access has to flow, uh, at least in part, through what we do. Um, and, um, and the good news is that the IDN and the universal access people have, made, have worked very hard to make sure that I have nothing to do. <laughs> uh, so, so that is great. Um, do we do we have anything to say on the subject? Actually, we do because we we do have some good statistics, for example, and uh, and we have some firm opinions on anyone who thinks that universal acceptance or IDN is in any way difficult because it is not. So if there's one thing to remind from this meeting, it is not difficult. So if anyone says, "Yeah, we'd like to do it, but it's difficult," it is not difficult. <laughs> So, uh, oh, yes, so on this panel are the people that we wrote the software that powers this stuff. We know this stuff. It is not difficult. So, with that, I hand over the mic. Okay. Uh, my name is Werner Staub. I work for Core Association. The uh, Core Association has been created about almost 20 years ago um, uh, to um, uh, start the reform of the domain name uh, industry, maybe, as you call it nowadays. Um, uh, now Core is a registry backend operator and the registry operator, three TLDs that happen to be IDN TLDs, we, cho we choose the difficult stuff. Um, it is not difficult. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, because <laughs> it is not difficult. Um, and we um, uh, run about uh, 18 registries for customers, including a fair number of community-based TLDs. Uh, Lately, I'm pretty much pretty busy on .swiss, which is, I mean, I'm happy to say that 
one of the more successful ones, at least demand-wise, you know, from the. But uh, as far as uh, new TLDs and universal acceptance and IDN is concerned, I'm disappointed by what we've achieved up to now. So uh, it's a good thing to look at what we should do. So thank you very much for the introduction. As you've seen on the agenda, we have Ram Mohan. Uh, he's the CTO of uh, Affilias, and uh, he's not with us today, but it's a good tradition at WHD Global uh, to have people uh, on video tape uh, also joining the panel discussions. So we have a video of Ram here, and we show you the short introduction he's giving us on the topic as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ram Mohan, and I'm the chairman of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group, a global initiative to ensure that your internet-connected devices and computers will accept domain names and websites, as well as emails, in your local language anywhere in the world. Did you know that there are 1.4 billion Chinese language speakers, 430 million Spanish language speakers, about 270 million Arabic and Hindi language speakers? Even the 20th largest language is Tamil, my own mother tongue, and that has 60 million speakers. On the internet, however, 56% of all websites are in English, 5% in Spanish and 3% in Chinese. As to Arabic or Hindi or Tamil, forget about it. What are the reasons behind the very slow uptake of the world's languages online? Why is it that you still need to type in English if you want to send an email in your local language to anybody in the world? What does it take to change the status quo so that any device will work with any language anywhere in the world? We are now witness to the largest ever expansion of the Internet's core domain names and web addresses. More than a thousand new domain names are now online and domain names and websites are available in more languages than ever before. Yet, why is it that computers, applications, your phones, web browsers, word processors struggle to handle a domain name like the Universal Acceptance Steering Group's very own website, www dot uasg dot tech t e c h why do computers have a problem understanding that dot tech is a real domain name online why do computers struggle to send an email with my own name in hindi and why do those computers push domain names and websites and email addresses like mine to the internet's black hole instead of processing them correctly how do we make sure that computer systems, applications, and operating systems worldwide can first recognize the thousands of these new domain names and email addresses, and second, understand how to correctly accept, validate, store, process, and finally display these names so that systems all over the world can say they are universal acceptance ready. This, my friends, is among the most important work of our times. Getting it right will mean that the next billion internet users can finally access the internet on their own terms, in their own language. The world demands our focus so that the internet of tomorrow accepts the languages and technologies of today. This is why you need to be part of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Participation is free. If you're looking to do meaningful work that will affect millions, if you want to truly make a difference, go to www.uasg.tech and sign up. Make Universal Acceptance a priority for you and your organization. Vanakkam. Gracias, namaste, danke, shukran, seshe. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, I guess it's clear. Everybody has to sign up um, after the session. So um, now we have an I, we have an idea on um, 
where the potential is for universal acceptance, how many people could be included to use the internet. But um, Bert, we have had a small discussion yesterday and we've been talking about the point, um, how far is it with the usage of IDNs nowadays? Can you give us an idea about that? That's why I arrived so late at this meeting. Um, so uh, as PowerDNS, we, we do the DNS for, for millions or hundreds of millions of um, internet subscribers. So any query those subscribers make uh, passes through our software. So um, that means that we get end user statistics. We can actually, uh, actually I don't get those statistics because people run my software. I'm not a cloud provider. So my customers get those numbers, but some of them are uh, friendly enough to uh, share anonymized data with us for uh, analysis purposes. And so I happen to have uh, 20 gigabytes of DNS data. You have to realize one DNS query is really small. So 20 gigabytes of DNS is really a lot. And uh, I ran the numbers on it, uh, how, which percentage of these queries, and these are from uh, countries all over Europe. Some of them with funny signs on their letters and some of them without. And um, we ran the numbers and out came for one country 0.003%. IDN, so I ran it again, but it didn't get any better. Um, and then I ran it from a few other countries that are more uh, accent happy. Uh, and there I got, the highest number I got was 0.02%. And the average is 0.01%. So that is almost nothing. And, and to make your day even worse, when I looked into those queries, many of them were malware. Uh, which apparently use IDN to hide their domain name. Um, okay. So the news is not good. Did you pass the, yeah. So I think even more terrifying still, I, I want to I read to you the uh, official definition that the Universal Acceptance Group has made for universal acceptance. Uh, universal acceptance is the state where all valid domain names and email addresses are accepted validated, stored, processed, and displayed correctly and consistently by all internet-enabled applications, devices, and systems. So, Ram mentioned those things before too, accept, validate, store, process, and display. You actually only got through the accept, maybe the validate part with your data. That's not even the rest of the process. It did not say work. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's even worse still. <laughs> Maybe, well, we're talking mostly here about IDN domain names, uh, but if you look at universal acceptance, it's, you know, like, like uh, the video said, uh, .tech is uh, somehow for some people not an, an acceptable extension for, uh, for a domain name. I remember when we started with, uh, with .u over 10 years ago, uh, we are very happy had the delegation in the Ayana, uh, with Diana in the root zone, so we were live on the internet, so we started sending out emails to people like you know, peter.jansen at uid.eu and it would happily come back saying like you know this email address uh, can't exist and that was just you know a cctld account code top level domain two letters which is acceptable in any which standard that you can imagine but still people think it necessary in their mail server to actually have an exhaustive list of accepted and existing extensions and eu was simply not there so it took a while to for all the world to catch up and say well i'll add .eu as an existing tld uh, and I, I guess with all the new GTLDs, even if they're in plain ASCII, it's exactly the same thing. People still have an exhaustive list checking if it is in there, and if it's not in there, it simply does not exist. And that's one of the things that I think uh, system administrators need to get right, and either get an updated list regularly from the places where they need to get it, or do their validation in a sensible way, which is, you know, if it looks okay, accept it as being okay and see if it works out, yes or no, but not blindly say, I don't know this, so I don't accept it. Okay, thank you. Um, as a co-chair of the USG, um, I know because I'm also a member of this working group at ICANN, um, I know that we have defined some um, proposals uh, how to get along with this issue of uh, having fixed uh, lists of uh, TLDs in, in software. So, Christian, would, would you like to reply on this? Sure, well, uh, there you, you have... Uh, I'm, I'm actually blanking on the, uh, um, on the name of the specific... I've got okay. There's rather than try to describe it, let's let's uh, let's kick to. Let me come back to that. Um, I'm because there is one specific list that I need to um, 
um, that I need to remember the name of, and I'm not remembering it. So let's move on um, for a second. We have one question, yes. Yeah, please. A lot of a lot of what we Neil, you work for a company that makes very fast <laughs> well, <clears throat> There is a project for this. I mean, it's called it's a working group called Debound right now in the uh, IDF that tries to look at the public suffix listing and add information to it. So we should work on this very hard uh, because it is not just needed for your purpose; it's needed for many other purposes as well. So um, I'm uh, relatively old enough that I was around when the first known um, John Postel area, uh, era TLD was invented, like .info and .biz. And we went sort of through the same pain at the time. Um, but at the time, people were trying to validate email addresses with regular expressions. And even then, with a sort of innumerable, a memorable list of top-level domains, people did not get it right. They messed it up. They would reject existing email addresses and they would accept horrible email addresses because people just assumed that it would look like blah, 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 at, and then someone had a plus in their domain name, oh, sorry, a plus in their email address and it would already not work. Um, so historically, even before the new TLDs and before IDN, people also did not get domain validation right. It was too complicated for the average web developer. Um, so, but, uh, to, uh, you, you got your point. Oh, so there's one, Final thing I'd like to, to say in this point. So we live in the age of web services. So there is a very nice web service called isemail.info. And isemail.info, you can fire a, a asynchronous, an AJAX query at it, and it will tell you this looks like an email address. That's the first thing it says. And then in addition to that, it will also say, well, actually, it actually would function as an email address. So that's the icing on the cake. Um, but at the very basic level, it will just tell you, yes, this is a domain name that exists. This is a proper thing. And any web developer can call out to isemail.info and get results. And if you don't want to rely on a third-party service, by the way, no web developer has an issue with that because they get jQuery from the Google CDN and they get all the other stuff from the Yahoo CDN. So I think they can also get rely on isemail.info. Um, but I'm sure you could host it at home or get it as a paid service or whatever. But is email.info, it does it all right. And so the average web developer does not have to get it right. Um, validation is, is one of the biggest things that we need to deal with. The Universal Acceptance Steering Group is focusing a lot of attention on trying to reach out to developers. A lot of them, um, they need to update old code. Uh, and uh, so when we're going through the process of trying to show them what to do, there is a, there's a CTO guide that we're nearing completion of that we'll be, uh, we'll be sending out to CTOs and CIOs around the world, and it's got recommendations on validation techniques that are modern. The next step, the harder step, isn't to show people modern methods of validation because most honestly, most of today's systems, they use these modern techniques. What is harder is to go back and to say, hey, you guys that wrote your web forms or your email clients or your browsers and you haven't updated them in 10 years, your, your, your apps, it is worth it for you to update your old systems and to recode them to these new standards. A lot of them don't see the financial value and, and so trying to figure out the best way to uh, give people motivations to go back and change old code is tough and a lot of what we're working on. Yeah, um, I have followed what the UA working group is doing and participating in the first meeting was in Marrakesh at the latest uh, update. And I decided at the meeting just to shut up. And I'm saying, you know, 
um, I'm, I'm opening my mouth now and I say, what it makes me feel, it, it looks like, is like to send off a rocket into orbit without enough fuel or too heavy payload. You know what the result is going to be. You know, if the payload is too heavy, I mean, with respect to the fuel, it's going to come down. If you don't have enough fuel, it's going to come down. I mean, there's, there's no point you know, in, in, in sending it up. It is not difficult as such. But if that parameter is wrong, forget it. It's Which a, parameter? The parameter of the amount of fuel that you, t that you need to take it up into orbit. How much work people are willing to spend? On? Well, it's how much lift do you get? Now, we don't get the lift, lift from developers. You know, they could care less. Mm -hmm. uh, right no, 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 developers. We care a lot, honestly. The issue is, people have these 10-year code bases that you described. Making, correcting a typo in that code is for many corporations, and we're talking about banks and insurance companies. They are the problem. It's not the hip web, it's not GitHub. Mm -hmm. the GitHub guys and, and all the modern people, they are on board. Google is on board, everyone is doing, they, they are doing it right. The issue is you're trying to sign up for a bank account with a .tech email address and your bank refuses. And that is because if they want to change a single typo in the code, there has to be a meeting of 12 people and a steering committee and a change advisory board and everything. It is astoundingly horrible. And it's only getting worse as more and more outsourcing of stuff goes on. So there, the, it's very interesting. So we have these, these, these 3 billion people that cannot have their own email address and they are not able to provide sufficient push to get the bank to fix their damn script. And so I, I think that is tremendous. So, and by the way, we lost we lost China to email, or or maybe they innovated because we wouldn't let them in. So they, they email is, is gone there. They're on WeChat, for for various other reasons. But email didn't get with the times. So in in China, you communicate with your bank over WeChat, because that actually did take into account uh, all the stuff that you need. Unlike our Western email system. So it's, it's very interesting to me that 3 billion people that are not here are actually not able, interesting enough for a bank to get its finger out. I think you're absolutely right. One thing that I'd like to frame up about the work that the Universal Acceptance Steering Group is doing, um, we're an outreach group. Uh, ICANN is a policy body. They helped us form, but we are an outreach group, and our goal is to go out there and, and spread the word about universal acceptance. And we haven't done much outreach. Um, we haven't even framed out what the outreach part looks like yet. Uh, also, you're lining up behind the IPv6 people and the DNSSEC people. Well, exactly. Well, and, and, and you call that sort of like the eat your broccoli stuff. The stuff that, you know, you know you've got to do it. You don't really want to do it. We're, we are not hopefully lining up behind them, but grouping with them. You are. Them, but grouping with them. <laughs> but um, the, the goal, see, we wanted to have something to say before we said it. We wanted to make sure that we had the right recommendations uh, and the right framing and the right definitions before we went out there uh, and started spreading the word. We, so we tried to do the due diligence of building some technical, just technical documents and some official recommendations, at which point the next stage, and the next stage is coming like within the next couple of months, we're going to start to frame out the messaging of um, how to get those documents into the hands of the right people. Now, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group isn't the only group that's working on uh, universal acceptance. There are a number of other groups that have put in some long hours and some really good efforts to go out there and raise awareness while we've been busy trying to figure out how to say something coherent. Uh, the uh, Domain Name Association has done some work. ECHO has done some fantastic work. And Lars Stefan, I, I commend you and your guerrilla marketing efforts towards... Uh, um, toward universal acceptance yourself. Well, while we were, uh, you know, gathering up things to make sure we said things in a certain way, you were out there pounding the pavement, and I think you get you get a lot of credit from me for that. Maybe one, one, one remark, maybe um, it's maybe weird or not, but maybe as Bert is a techie and I'm sort of a techie and, and, and at heart, um, I sort of agree with Bert. I mean, it's not hard. Uh, it's you know, it's just making sure that you accept whatever you need to accept. Unicode is a character set that you need to accept. It's not just A to Z, zero to nine, and a dash. It's, it's, it's just more than that. So what's interesting is indeed that the world at large, the Chinese being one huge group, but several others uh, are there, apparently do not have enough clout to, to, to convince vendors of, or builders of software, be it client software, or to browse for email, whatever, to actually do the right thing and get this done. I mean. 
I don't know. It's 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 weird. It's if people really want this, if they make noise, I suppose that that vendors will actually get it done. So why is the world not that interested then? It's it's that's weird. I guess. I, uh, I think it's the Chinese example is very important to look at, and this is the essential thing to do. And if we talk about IDN at all, it's because back in 2005, you know, the Chinese said, look, unless you do something, we're going to go totally our own way, you know, setting, uh, setting up a system. Uh, so finally, ICANN started to listen in 2005 about, uh, about IDN. Uh, before ICANN had said, it's enough to do IDN underneath that. Uh, but uh, when uh, when this happened, it was largely too late, and you could only have to only have to look at Korea and Japan to see what happened. In Japan, if somebody if if an advertiser advertises a, a company name, they will write the billboard. Instead of the billboard, billboard, they show a mouse cursor next to a button that says search in in, in Japanese. I mean, it says Kensa search in in Japanese. In the, in the, the, my, Click, you know, click here, you know, and it's it in the field. It says what you should search for in, in the but it, it does not occur to them to tell the user to type something that the user believes that they can do. And it gets worse because now A believes that B believes that C believes that it doesn't work. So to get that back is very difficult, but there is a way. But I don't think the way is preaching. I mean, it's, of course, it is important to preach, and that's that's what we that's what we're doing here. <laughs> but we we have to look beyond preaching. And uh, there's two things. I mean, to look at the metaphor of the of the rocket: increase lift, reduce the payload. Uh, that is the only way to, to to get up there. I mean, probably reduce the payload just m more than you might want to. They just give up on something. And one of the things that we certainly should give up in terms of the next steps is the email in front of the at sign. You know, that is totally useless and impossible to implement because it would require changing all the mail servers in the world. The servers, not the clients. No, 10 year upgrade cycles or 15 year upgrade cycles. Hopeless. So get rid of that. It's, it's, um, uh, reduce the payload. And the other one is, you know, get more lift, which is, you know, create content in there. Now we have many registries, I mean, look at .eu. It's, uh, we're just gonna roll, roll out .eu in, in, in Cyrillic. If we just wait for people to come, you know, to get the domain, forget it. I mean, this is no, we're building a new city like Karlsruhe was built, like many cities were built on the drawing board. Here's, you know, here's this, here's that. Put it there first, which is not just wait for people to come. If you wait for people to come without taking the initiative by the registries, some good advice. Any other comments on this? <laughs> well, if you give me the mic, then uh, you have 15 minutes before the session is over, right? Yeah. Um, you're, you're right, but you know, when we when we started this whole IDN thing, this was back in, in 2009, if I remember correctly. Then it was IDNA 2003, which was a standard uh, which uh, everybody was going to support and which would, well, was going to be there forever, right? So we implemented that and then just a classical example, uh, the German language, which isn't too bad in terms of accents and all that, has this weird S called the Ringel S or the S set or whatever, sharp S, whatever you want to call it. Um, and German people are actually used to typing it as SS because their typing writers at a certain moment in time didn't support the S set, so they were got used to typing SS. And that's what INA 2003 did. If you register the domain name Gross with an S set, you would actually get Gross with a double S. Then to INA 2008 came along because people started saying, yeah, you know, we would really like to have our proper characters instead of, of this, this, this bullshit of changing one to the other. So then we implemented INA 2008, which basically says if you want an asset, you can get an asset. Which faced a problem where we were facing a huge problem because people that wanted gross with an asset but got gross with SS, and now all of a sudden somebody else can get gross with asset. And all this is sort of confusing to people because who is who, what is what, where is where, right? So we decided, you know, okay, we're going to go with, with the flow and we're going to do this support for asset, but we're going to make sure that this can be abused in one way or the other. So what we're saying is if you want gross with SS or gross with asset, if you're the first, you can get it, but you can't get the other one. Nobody else can get the other one. Just to avoid that if you have an old browser which still translates the asset to SS, you go somewhere else where you shouldn't be going. 
not necessarily so. There are some ways of doing that, but the standard procedure is if one is given out, the other one can't, can't be given out for the very simple reason that if, you know, if you still have an ancient Firefox or whatever with INA 2003 support, and you type gross with SZ and you really want to go to gross with SZ.eu, you're actually going to gross with SS, which is maybe somebody else. So, which is what, is what we call homoglyph bundling because it somehow looks alike. And the same for Greek, for instance, you have the sigma, which at the end of the word is actually written differently, which is called the final sigma. 2003 said, you know, if you write a word with a final sigma, nah, 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 you can't have that, we'll translate this to a normal sigma. 2008 now says, no, let's support Greek people like they're supposed to be supported, you know, the final sigma is extra, an extra a real character in the Greek language, so let's support this. All of a sudden you have the same word, soldier, stratiatos, ends and starts with a sigma, but if it's written correctly, it starts with a normal sigma and ends with a final sigma. But if you're under 2003 support, you only have the final sigma, not being the final sigma, but the normal sigma. So again, what we said is, let's bundle this up because this is going to create havoc everywhere. But this is still before the dot, right? Still dot EU in Latin. Now for the German language, it's a Latin script, so dot EU makes sense, but for the Greek language or the Cyrillic language, which is a Greek script or a Cyrillic script, the dot EU in Latin doesn't make sense. If you want to give people the power to use the internet in their own native language, you should have the complete URL, be it an email address or a website, doesn't really matter, completely in their script. For the moment, we have Greek.eu in Latin. We have Cyrillic.eu in Latin. And indeed, on the 1st of June, after many years of going up and down with the European Commission and ICANN and all powers that be in the world, we finally, on the 1st of June, will launch .eu in Cyrillic. And we will actually go through the motion of saying, if you want to use .eu in Cyrillic, before the dot, it has to be Cyrillic. We're not going to go, you know, the silly way and say you can have Latin dot Cyrillic or Greek dot Cyrillic because that does not make sense. So we will go Cyrillic dot Cyrillic and Latin dot Latin. For the moment, we still will go Greek dot uh, Latin because we don't have the Greek extension yet. That's still a work in process. We'll get there when we get there. Uh, maybe you know this decade or the next one. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but the whole point is, you know, the whole URL or email address, whatever you want to call it, should be in one consistent way written, either Latin.Latin, .Latin, Greek dot Greek, or Cyrillic dot Cyrillic. That's, you know, I'll stop here because... People, I take everything back. It is difficult. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you've, you have shielded me of this pain. Yes. Now. So maybe one argument. Um, we are now, so this is about the open internet. I work for a company called Open Exchange, so I care about open. Um, with these standards, everyone can email me. I can launch a company, I can get an email address, which is an open service. I could get that email address, I could run it myself, I could get it from somewhere else. My customers can communicate with me over this open system. Um, we are now more and more seeing that people have to open a Facebook account so that customers will communicate with them. This is In different countries, this trend is further along than in other countries. Uh, but in Africa, for example, Facebook is a prime way to communicate with business. Um, PowerDNS has an office in uh, The Hague and uh, next door we have an Italian restaurant and I only talk to them over Facebook to make appointments because it's a lot easier. Um, if we do not defend the open internet by being inclusive, we will see more and more of the internet move to closed communication systems which are able to solve this problem within their own little universe. Um, your very good remark about how it, it, advertising is done in Japan with the, this is the search bar and enter this stuff in there and you'll hopefully end up on our page, and we usually will. It goes back to the AOL keywords, which were the sort of predecessor of domain names where people would actually not, they would just say, go to great cars, and they would own the keyword great cars. AOL, America Online, owns that sort of domain name system. If we do not make the internet inclusive and make it serve the rights of these three billion people that Ran mentioned, they will start communicating over Facebook and we will have lost them and our, the internet will be worse for it. Thank you, Bert, for uh, mentioning this. So we have some certain points. We have internationalized domain names that are not working properly everywhere. We have the internationalized uh, email addresses. We have this issue with uh, email address validation on websites and portals and stuff like that. So we also raised some points that we can't turn back the, th the things back in time. So we have the situation right now that we have to deal with it. And, um, Vanna, you also raised the point, yeah, but we have to uh, figure out how to fix this. So, the question in the round to all of you, how can we fix this in a certain period of time that everyone can use 
this technology to use the internet and that the internet is the inclusive universe that everyone can use. So, I've got two recipes. Oh. Um, uh, one of them is, I mentioned it before, get more lift. And the real lift comes from actual user interaction. The one thing that is in every user's name, uh, head, sorry, in every user's head already, don't have to plant the brands in there. Brands are difficult to put in there. But uh, what every user knows is generic words and geographic names. They're, they're, they're already you know, coded in, in, in there. So if new GTLD registries do proactive namespace development on geographic names and uh, generic words, they will be able to get the cloud of words, not just individual words, but the whole cloud of words, you know, kind of recognized by users, and users will start to use them. It's like creating a city center. The other thing is even simpler. It is just about a little bit more. And that is the browsers. The browsers are right now being subsidized by search engines, you know, one of them in particular. And, uh, and uh, of course, they will do as their master tells them to do. So any little thing on the user interface can change. And I think able to observe what, how the browsers have changed by observing people who used to know what the domain name is. But now my niece is asking me, how do I get to openoffice.org and be sure that I'm at, I'm at openoffice.org? She used to be able to do that. She's a teacher. But she's so insecure now that she does not know for sure if there's a way to be sure that she goes to openoffice.org. So this depends on the user interface of the browser. And this ultimately depends on subsidies paid. So all the companies should realize, and those, those who have, you know, real brands, if their customer is going to be redirected to search, the brands give up their customer, their marketing intelligence to the search engines and have to buy it back from them. Uh, that is not a good deal. So just for them to put a little bit of money into subsidies for, you know, um, that would be very good. So I um, have one non-technical suggestion, and uh, that's just call it racism. Okay. Just say, look, if you're not supporting Dot Asia, that's bad. You're, <laughs> you're bad. You're not inclusive. And uh, and actually, uh, if you if you play your card right and you say, look, you're shutting out the entire Hindi population because you're you are not supporting the the Dot Hindi domain in their script, and uh, you're being white. You're all white people blocking this stuff. So this is my non-technical advice. I usually stick to my technical advice. Uh, so here's my technical advice. Um, when you say people improve your validation, that, that raises a whole bunch of new questions. Uh, as an alternative, say, well, just don't do validation because you're going to check the email address anyhow. So just stop it. Just accept anything there. Perhaps make a warning that says, doesn't quite look like an email address, but just stop it. Just because you're validating afterwards anyhow. That's my non-technical, my technical advice. Thank you. Um, on the technical side, maybe, uh, well, you know, we were done when we started with this DNS, right? Uh, with IDN or non-IDN, uh, two-letter, top-level domains, three-letter, five-letter, seven-letter, doesn't really matter, DNS is ready. Because the IDN system actually translates everything behind the scenes to ASCII anyway. So, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's let's replace the DNS protocol by something completely new, right? Uh, a REST interface, maybe? Anyway, um, so on the technical side, you know, we were done before we even started. Uh, where, the, where the interesting part was at the, is at the registry level, uh, who is entitled to what domain name? And, and then you have these things as first come, first serve, the confusion part, which I already talked to, so these, these, these nov innovative things like homoglyph bundling. You know, if you look at Latin E and a Cyrillic E, they're exactly the same if you look at them at, at face value. It's especially in some fonts, they look exactly the same. So how will people be able to know, how can they be sure that they go where they need to go uh, and want to go if, if, if it looks the same? So what we have in place as well is a system where you have now, if you have EE in Latin, .eu, you can't have EE, the Cyrillic equivalent, because it looks exactly the same, so we're not going to hand that out, because people might abuse this in one way or the other, consciously or unconsciously, doesn't really matter. So we will stop this from happening. So there is one and only one, so people can't abuse this sort of thing. Uh, so on the technical level, um, 
we're done uh, on, well, unless IDNA 2010 or 2015 or 2017 is gonna add some new stuff, but that's mostly in the Arab uh, scripts and things like that, which we're really not concerned with for the moment in, uh, in the European Union. Not yet, we'll see when, uh, when somebody will join the European Union with an Arab script. Um, on, the, on, the, on the user interface or on the, on the, on the people's interface or whatever you wanna call it, it's, there's only one thing, world education. You know, tell people that this exists and this is possible. When we started with .eu, People didn't know that .eu existed. They didn't, you know, think this was the real thing. So this takes a while for people to realize, and that's, you know, put the message out there. And that's money, that is, that is, that is education, that is mind share. Make sure people know that this is possible and this is happening. And that's, I think, where we should uh, put the effort. It's world education, which is simple, but not simple. Because it's on a worldwide scale, which doesn't make it simple, I guess. So before I, I answer, I want to I want to talk a little bit about one of the case studies that we're working on in um, uh, in the Universal Accepted Steering Group. We got ICANN themselves to agree to be a test case and to update all of their systems for Universal Acceptance readiness. Um, they took a look and they said, "Okay, we've got 78 systems, internal and external, that touch the um, that touch the domain name system in a way that could have a problem with Universal Acceptance." We tested these systems. 11 of them don't really have anything to do with uh, processing, validating, uh, uh, um, or storing. Um, and so it's not gonna be a problem. 36 of them um, have already been updated and there are problem, no problems there. The rest of them need to be updated. So dozens of systems need to be updated. Um, we need to convince people that they need to take on what ultimately is, if not difficult work, because the technical standards are there, it's still laborious work to update all those systems to get this stuff right. Um, I'm actively involved in projects to try and convince people to do this, and it will take financial arguments. You're, you're going to lose money if you don't um, if you don't make these changes in your systems. You're going to lose business opportunity. Uh, it's going to take ideological arguments. The whole idea that this is uh, you know you're going to miss it on the next uh, you're going to disempower the next billion, um, and also it's going to take arguments from governments and, and people to put this into the procurement process. And so we're actually going out and we're talking to governments about, about making sure that, you know, this is a part of the process. You said, you know, make it something that we're going to use it. You're racist. I say, you know, in a, I'm from the United States. Uh, we're going to talk to the people uh, who operate the Americans with Disabilities Act stuff to make sure that when you are, when you are building systems um, that support, um, you know, the deaf and the blind, you're also going to build in standards um, to support this. And so we have to ha ha handle it through multiple ways in order to convince people to update their systems. But we're working on it. Yes, thank you, Christian. So I guess the key message is we can't turn this technical um, thing back in time. So we have to fix this. We have to do outreach. Everybody here on the stage and in the audience should be involved. So the Universal, Steer Universal Acceptance Steering Group is producing paper to do outreach to certain communities, to special target groups. So visit uasg.tech where you can find all those documents. We can support you as well in reaching out. And um, one small um, anecdote at the end, I would say, uh, because we are running out of time, is we found one website at the UASG uh, yet that's absolutely 100% UA ready. You know which it was? I don't remember now. It was myspace.com. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, I would say we have a good finalized round now. So, um, thank you everybody for joining the panel on Universe Acceptance. One great thing you could do is make a, the is email.info guys, they're very nice, but they might turn off their service any day. Please you set up is email.info and make I can commit behind it or some kind of organization that can say we'll keep this running for five years and we'll give you five years notice when we turn it off. Uh, because I, I would personally have issues relying on is email.info until I know why these guys are doing it. Maybe they will spam all the email they validate. But that would, that would help tremendously in the validation process.
We'll take the notes on that. Uh, I think there are plenty of ways in which, in which the Universal Acceptance Steering Group can continue to grow and, and build more resources that are going to aid the community, and these are good ideas uh, that we can take back and, and discuss. Uh, one other thing before we close, uh, you should go check out Lars's podcast on this subject. You do very good work on that as well. Yeah, we, we can spread the link afterwards. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you for joining the Universal Acceptance uh, Discussion Panel in this morning. Uh, we will continue at 11 o'clock with the next TLD talk uh, about dot brands. So, stay tuned here in the room and uh, spread the word maybe on Twitter and Facebook that we will start in a few minutes about dot brands. So thank you for attending and we'll continue in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>